where you see the passing of time. We crowd in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. And the girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big baby salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. There was a time, not so very long ago really, when Americans saw themselves as immune to terrorism. U.S. citizens traveled abroad freely and safely. They felt secure at home, protected by oceans to the east and west, and by friendly neighbors to the north and south. Political extremism and the brazen acts of terrorists were things that happened to other people. But that was the era before planes were hijacked, before hostages were taken, and before Americans became the targets of terror bombs. In the 1990s, Americans learned they were not only in danger overseas, they were vulnerable at home. And if there was ever any doubt about the truth of this, it vanished in Oklahoma City on April 19, 1995. Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! It's like a war zone down there. Just sitting at my desk working. All of a sudden, explosion, roof caved in. Hundreds of casualties. Many people still trapped inside. This is just cold-blooded murder any way you put it. It's collapsed. It's collapsed all over me. And the walls fell in, and there was nothing left. Holy cow. About a third of the building has been blown away. The most destructive act of terrorism ever on United States soil. The Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in downtown Oklahoma City. You see this kind of stuff on TV, not in your backyard. Seems like the whole world ended. Can you tell me your name? 9 a.m. Nine stories crumbled. An estimated 900 individuals are inside. Then came numbers no one wanted to hear. My entire staff of about seven people is gone. At least 20 people are confirmed dead at this. The death toll in the bombing now tops 36. Dozens of bodies on every one of the floors behind me. The death toll continues to climb. Now stands at 65. I'm officially 82. There's a fair chance that body count will exceed 100. And it did. 169 lives were lost. Men, women, children too. Dropped off at a daycare center there called America's Kids. This is America. We shouldn't have to run scared. We shouldn't have to worry about taking a three-year-old and a two-year-old to a daycare and kissing them goodbye. Oh, come here. Dude. Make no mistake about it. This was an attack on the United States, our way of life, and everything we believe in. We will find the people who did this. we got to find this brother. The attack came without warning, and according to a U.S. government source, told CBS News that it has Middle East terrorism written all over it. The mere mention of Middle East terrorism caused an immediate tightening of security in the nation's capital, and making that connection seemed logical at the time, considering America's most recent experience with a massive bomb. Two years earlier, 1,300 miles away in New York on February 26, 1993, people began to pour out of the World Trade Center, faces blackened by smoke. Faces filled with fear after a huge bomb went off. Something blew. Something big blew. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Get a resuscitator on! But there was a critical difference between the two bombings. The enemy in Oklahoma turned out not to be some group of foreign-based terrorists, but domestic insurgents, 
Americans apparently so disenchanted, they resorted to the destruction of a government building, indifferent to the suffering of those caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. It had been a blustery day in New York. Let the smog read. You can read. You can breathe. You didn't know whether the fire was below you or above you. You didn't know which way to go. The stairs were just packed with people. We didn't think we were going to get out at all. 50,000 people work on the 110-story World Trade Center. More than another 50,000 visit every day. But on this day, a bomb went off in the underground parking garage. The blast collapsed walls, sent bodies and cars hurtling in the air, and blew out a crater 100 feet wide. Six people were killed, more than 1,000 injured. Can it be anything but shook up a little bit when something like that happens in our own country here? In the initial aftermath, all anyone could ask was who did it and why. It didn't take long to get some answers. There were in excess of 200 cars in the garage at the time of the blast. Uh, we think we know almost all of the license plates. Investigators began the tedious process of sifting through the record. I think I can say without qualification, there is no higher priority for all of law enforcement in the United States today than solving this case. The big break came when agents from alcohol, tobacco, and firearms zeroed in on the charred and mangled pieces of a yellow Ford van that had every mark of having carried the lethal explosives. Federal agents traced the van to a car rental agency in Jersey City where the vehicle had been rented the day before the bombing. The man who rented the truck was arrested, charged with aiding and abetting the bombing. His name was Mohammed Salame. He's a Palestinian with a Jordanian passport who's apparently been in this country illegally. And law enforcement sources say his name showed up in Washington's computer files on terrorist organizations. Investigators said that after the bombing, Salome returned to the car rental lot where he reported the van stolen and tried to get his deposit back. And investigators linked items found in the apartment he was using with bomb making. Authorities closed the El Salam Mosque where the suspect is believed to worship. The mosque has long been suspected as a base for fundraising for any number of interconnected, little-known Islamic fundamentalist groups. The leader of Salome's mosque was identified as Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, a tribune of revolution, of violence against non-believers. We will continue the struggle to the last drop of blood until we get what we are fighting for. This is a man who had a long rap sheet. He was deeply implicated in the assassination of Anwar Sadat. Fouad Ajami is professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He is a consultant to CBS News. And yet he could get on a plane and end up in, in Jersey City and Brooklyn um, preaching the, the, the fall of the Egyptian regime and preaching against America itself. Not only had most Americans never heard of the sheikh, a blind Egyptian cleric, but the intensity of his fervor stunned them. What we have to remember is we've been at war with radical uh, Islamic extremist groups for at least a decade. These are the same people that hit us in, in, uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere. The World Trade Center episode, it, if you will, shrunk the Atlantic. So much as we like to think that these outposts in the Middle East are far away, the fact of the matter is that the Middle East has come home to us and it is a factor in, in the modern lives of nations. At least two men suspected in the attack fled the country, but eventually four Muslims, including one of the fugitives, were convicted for the World Trade Center bombing. But a year after they were sentenced to life in prison, there were still unanswered questions. The five-month trial failed to reveal a motive or expose possible international sponsorship. Authorities say Ramzi Youssef, a fugitive defendant, holds the key to those answers. He is suspected of being an Iraqi agent who escaped to Baghdad. Then, in February 1995, two years after the World Trade Center bombing, the remaining fugitive, Ramzi Youssef, was arrested in Pakistan and turned over to U.S. authorities. And the trail of terror which erupted in the Middle East and played itself out in a dramatic way in Europe uh, in the 1980s, it came our way and there is no evidence that, that we have seen the end of it. Americans had no history of being targets for terrorists. In fact, most Americans felt themselves immune to the endless cycle of violence that had gripped other parts of the world. Two events in the Middle East spawned modern terrorism, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and the 1967 Middle East War. 
radical Palestinians, driven first into refugee camps and then humiliated on the battlefield in 1967, were obsessed with the idea of destroying Israel and establishing an independent state. But those squalid refugee camps became a breeding ground for frustration, frustration that turned to international terrorism as a way of calling attention to their demands. The shadow of American power has lain over the Middle East for uh, now nearly two decades. A generation had grown up amidst economic failure, amidst economic frustration. And they had a philosophy that told them, that told them and simplified the world for them, that America is the great Satan. Within those passions that the story of terrorism is best understood. The rage and frustration boiled over into a spectacular series of hijackings in September of 1970 by elements of the Palestine Liberation Organization led by Yasser Arafat. And for the first time, Americans were placed directly in the line of fire. The guerrilla hijack team struck four airlines almost simultaneously. Three attacks succeeded. But Israeli security forces and crew members overwhelmed the team aboard an El Al flight killing an Arab man and capturing his female companion, a veteran hijacker. The successful teams forced two planes, Swiss Air and Transworld Airlines, to an airstrip which had been carved into the desert near Amman, Jordan. Palestinian guerrillas also hijacked a Pan American 747, but instead of taking it to Jordan, they flew it to Cairo, where, after evacuating the passengers and crew, they blew up the $23 million aircraft on the ground. Then the guerrilla hijackers struck again, the British Overseas Airways Corporation jet with 113 persons aboard, taken over the Persian Gulf in order to Beirut, where these photographs were taken. It too then was flown to that Jordanian desert strip called Dawson Field. For a week, the terrorists held 300 passengers hostage in the broiling desert sun, demanding the release of their comrades captured in the foiled El Al hijacking. Are the passengers coping? Hey, everybody is coping extremely well. Suddenly, the drama ended almost as spectacularly as it began. The destruction of the three jets this morning was unexpected with the deadline still half a day away. First, the guerrillas led the passengers off the TWA 707, the Swiss Air DC-8, and the British Overseas Airways BC-10. They gave us time to get off in the order of friendliness, said one of the passengers. The Germans first, then the Swiss, Finally, the Americans. Then the commandos all left the planes except for their sappers, the demolition teams, who blew the planes up one every five minutes. It was the first blow by the Palestine Liberation Organization in what was to become 10 years of terror directed mainly against Israel. Driven from Jordan in 1981, the PLO sought shelter in the anarchy that was Lebanon. This became, if you will, the return address for all kinds of, of, of terrorist operation. The Israelis put up with this for a decade or so, and in the summer of, of 1982, they drove into Lebanon in a big way and, and threw the PLO uh, out of Lebanon. The Palestinians then had to find a home, and the decision was there was no other place to go to other than Tunisia. But the Israelis were determined to eradicate the PLO as a threat. So in October of 1985, they bombed the organization's headquarters in Tunisia. They killed some of the PLO's top leaders, but failed to eliminate Yasser Arafat. Arafat was there in the wilderness. He was in North Africa. He was in Tunis, thousands of miles away from the land he was claiming. And terror was one of the weapons. A Palestine Liberation Organization commando team has reportedly seized an Italian cruise ship in the Mediterranean Sea. The hijackers reported threat to blow up the ship. The ship is the Achille Laro, unless Israel releases 50 jailed Palestinians. Arafat immediately condemned the hijacking. This circle of violences in the area will lead to a disaster. Arafat was a fox. Arafat was in part um, a man of terror and in part a man of diplomacy. But let's remember one thing. The man who masterminded the Akili Laro, Abu Abbas, was a man who was a member of the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization. This was no rogue operation. Tarafat played it both ways. 
Denied safe harbor in both Cyprus and Syria, the hijackers focused their anger on the few Americans on board. Reports unconfirmed that one, perhaps two Americans, among the passenger hostages may, may have been killed. The hijackers had in fact killed wheelchair-bound Leon Klinghoffer and had pushed his body into the sea. They told the captain to say nothing of the violence as the ship returned to Egyptian waters where the drama ended quickly. Four hijackers leave the Achille Lauro. They weigh from an Egyptian tug. They are promised safe passage. The world learns later they have killed. Ailing and elderly Leon Klinghoffer, one of the American hostages, is nowhere to be found aboard ship. He is presumed dead. I can't understand what happened or how it happened. I don't understand how a 69-year-old man in a wheelchair can be a threat to anybody and why they would kill him. As more details emerged, it became apparent that the few Americans on board the ship had been singled out. One of these uh, terrorists, particularly a uh, short young fellow who seemed to really uh, have it in for the Americans, Despite American outrage at the killing, the Egyptians said it was too late to do anything. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak said today that the four Palestinians who hijacked the Achille Lotto have been released from custody and are no longer in Egypt. Mubarak said they were freed before Egypt knew of the murder of Leon Klinghoffer, an American citizen traveling on the ship. Why didn't the captain tell us that uh, there was somebody killed? would have changed our mind in the whole process. But despite the Egyptian claims, U.S. intelligence learned that the terrorists were still in Egypt and were scheduled to leave the next day in a chartered aircraft. The U.S. decided to act on its own. The four Palestinian gunmen are in the hands of the Italian police this morning, and here is how they got there. They were on an Egyptian jet bound for Tunisia. Seemingly, uh, they were getting away scot-free, but four U.S. Navy F-14 fighters swooped in, intercepted the Egyptian jet, and forced it to the NATO base on Sicily instead. On the runway, Navy commandos and Italian police surrounded the plane and seized the hijackers. They've been whisked off to the base to an unknown destination, where they are being questioned about the hijacking and the murder of American Leon Klinghoffer. Despite Italian prosecutors' request for life sentences for the Palestinians, it was clear from the trial that not everyone shared America's belief that they were terrorists. All through this trial, the hijackers' defense had been that they were not terrorists but were freedom fighters in the Palestinian cause. It was an appeal for sympathy from the court, and the court was, to a certain extent, sympathetic. The judge explained the defendants were young, they had no criminal record, they had, quote, grown up in the tragic conditions which the Palestinian people endure. Even though the Palestinians were given 15 to 30 year sentences instead of life, the sentences the prosecutors had requested, their comrades vowed revenge for America's intervention, and it wasn't long in coming. TWA Flight 840 from Rome with 124 people on board was on its final descent for a landing in Athens. Ten minutes away, ten minutes from safety, a bomb exploded. It is believed to have been in the passenger compartment, row 10, right side. Four passengers were killed, three of those were American citizens, four other Americans were among the injured. It didn't take authorities long to point a finger. The prime suspect was a Lebanese woman, May Mansour, who boarded the plane in Cairo after what TWA called the most rigorous of security checks. She sat in seat 10F. She got off the plane in Athens. Yesterday, May Mansour, a political activist, said in Lebanon she was on the plane, but she said she is innocent. I did not do it. Libyan leader Gaddafi denied his involvement, though not everyone believed him. An unknown Arab group said it was responsible. Investigators were looking into a maze of terrorist connections. That maze now included Iran, once a staunch ally of the United States. But the overthrow of the Shah in 1979 had changed all that almost overnight. In November, a group of young Iranians calling themselves students overran the American embassy in Tehran, capturing more than 90 Americans. Some were released. But 52 stayed behind, held hostage. Calling the U.S. Embassy a nest of spies, the hostage takers reflected the strident anti-Americanism of the new Iranian regime. A regime which blamed the U.S. 
for keeping the Shah in power. Deadlines have come and gone and promises have been made and broken, but the American hostages in Tehran remain today where they've been for 18 weeks, prisoners in their own embassy. Now the latest deadline is noon tomorrow. And we are sure that the representatives of the people in the Islamic Council will detain the hostages until the criminal Shah is returned. The Iran crisis appears to be just about back to square one. Ayatollah Khomeini today issued a tough statement, siding with the militants holding the U.S. Embassy. The way things look now in Tehran, the American diplomats could remain prisoners in their embassy until May or June or perhaps even July. The militants insist they will not turn them over to Iran's lawful government until the new parliament convenes in late May. The parliamentary debate on the fate of the hostages is likely to be long and acrimonious and may include such wholly unacceptable conditions for release of the hostages as the return of the Shah. If this happens, the hostages could wait even beyond July. The crisis dragged on for more than a year and contributed to Jimmy Carter's loss of the presidency. In just 25 more days, it will be Ronald Reagan's turn to deal with the Iranians, to somehow find a way of bringing the hostages home. 444 days after being taken hostage, they were released. On January 20, 1981, the day so President you, Reagan was inaugurated. Now, congratulate you, sir. That's the way it is. Tuesday, January 20th, 1981. A day that began as the 444th day of captivity and ended as the first day of freedom for the American hostages in Iraq. The triumph of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran had repercussions that extended far beyond the borders of Iran. Where the Shah of Iran had been a friend of the United States, Khomeini was an implacable enemy. The U.S. was, in his words, the great Satan. In addition, Khomeini saw himself as the leader of a fundamentalist religious revival that would sweep the corrupt rulers of the Middle East from power. There was the great Pied Piper of terror, Ayatollah Khomeini himself. He inspired an ideology of hate. First stop for this new message, Lebanon, torn by years of civil war. In Lebanon at the time were U.S. Marines sent there to try to help keep the peace. But they were also targets for militant Shiite Muslims, members of the anti-American Iranian-backed Hezbollah, also known as Islamic Jihad. A suicide bomber from Hezbollah pulled up over there in what was then the courtyard of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. His car bomb killed 63 people, including 17 Americans, and wounded over 100 more. It was the opening salvo in a war of terror. That blast wiped out the CIA's intelligence operation in Beirut, so the Pentagon sent now retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel Bill Cowan, a special operations intelligence officer, into Beirut to find out who was responsible. The Iranians were involved in funding the material and the operation. The Syrians were more actively involved and directly. They helped move the material in from Syria, from Damascus, here to Beirut, to fabricate the bomb. They provided technical expertise to the building of the bomb and uh, general oversight to the operation. Then on Sunday, October 23rd, Hezbollah struck again. It was just before dawn at Marine Headquarters, Beirut, a four-story building at the airport. Cooks were getting up to make breakfast. The others were sleeping late. Suddenly, a pickup truck loaded with explosives approached through an airport parking lot, accelerated past a sentry, crashed through barriers and sandbags, and then went directly into the building's lobby. There, it blew up. Within seconds, the building was rough. Within seconds, more than 100 Marines and sailors were dead or dying, the heaviest U.S. casualties since Vietnam. One survivor's reaction, I cried, I cursed. Suspicion quickly focused on Iran as one of the fomenters of the attack. 
CBS News has learned that as recently as September, U.S. intelligence intercepted communications between the Iranian embassy in Beirut and the Iranian foreign ministry in Tehran, indicating an attack against American forces and installations in Lebanon was being discussed. Exactly when, where, and how was not clear, but intelligence analysts now link those intercepted messages to Sunday's carnage at Beirut airport. U.S. intelligence, Sheikh Tufaili, the CIA, Pentagon, who came here to Beirut after the bombings of the embassy and the marine barracks, told us that it was carried out by Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, funded by Iran, and that the Syrians provided the expertise to make the bomb. The CIA's allegation that Hezbollah did that is an honor, and a good guess by the CIA about the Hezbollah. But in fact, we did not do that. We did not get support from the Iranians or from the Syrians. Uh, so you approve of what happened, but you say that you had nothing to do with any of it. We are sorry for that. You're sorry for that? You wish you had had something to do? Definitely. When you look back on it, we had sent a peacekeeping force into Lebanon. They were not viewed as peacekeepers because this was a, this was a tangled environment, a hostile environment and we couldn't order the politics of Lebanon. Despite brave promises to stay the course, the U.S. ultimately did pull out of Lebanon, its mission in tatters. The final toll from that bombing, 241 servicemen killed, 112 wounded. The success of the bombing seemed to embolden the Iranian-backed Shiites to escalate their attacks against Americans. Now, though, Americans outside the chaos of Lebanon would be the targets. June 1985. They are beating the passengers. They are beating the passengers. They are threatening to kill them now. They are threatening to kill them now. We want the fuel now. TWA Flight 847 was on its way from Athens to Rome today with 153 people aboard. It never made it there. The plane was hijacked by two armed Shiites. They forced the pilot to fly first to Beirut, then to Algiers, and then back to Beirut. Even by Middle East standards, this hijacking has been particularly brutal. Shortly after landing in Beirut for the second time last night, the hijacker shot an American through the head. The pilot, who remained incredibly calm with a grenade held to him, reported the killing. They're about to shoot a passenger, TWA 847. They are not at the radio. They're about to shoot a passenger. They just shot a passenger, TWA 847. The passenger who was shot was a Navy diver, Robert Dean Steedham, who before his brutal execution had been pistol whipped repeatedly by the hijackers after they discovered he was an American serviceman. The terrorists demanded the release of more than 700 Shiite Muslim prisoners held in Israel. The hijackers threatened to kill the hostages one by one if their demands were not met. And worse yet, the drama was just beginning. TWA Flight 847 still stands at Beirut Airport but just where the hostages are is a mystery. Late last night, the airport exploded in gunfire as the Shiite militiamen guarding the plane thought they were under attack from the air and sea. A short time later, under cover of darkness, Beirut's top Shiite leader says he ordered the hostages removed from the plane. I will try to bring all the passengers from the plane to outside the airport because I am afraid Something happened to them, and I'm responsible now. That's all. Barry says the Americans are now being held somewhere in the teeming slums of the Muslim half of this city. His men, he says, are guarding them along with the hijackers. The drama dragged on. At one point, the hijackers paraded some of the hostages before the world's press. Alan Conwell, an American hostage from Houston, pleaded for diplomacy. We as a group do most importantly want to beseech President Reagan and our fellow Americans to refrain from any form of military or violent means as an attempt, no matter how noble or heroic, to secure our freedom. That would only cause, in our estimation, additional unneeded and unwarranted deaths among innocent peoples. On the 11th day of the crisis, Israel released 31 Shiite prisoners as a gesture to the hijackers. The hijackers' response, it's not enough. But there were signs the crisis was easing. 
This is Larry Pinsack at Beirut Airport. Hostage Jim Palmer is here at the airport about to board a flight to freedom. Uh, at a news conference a little while ago, a Shiite leader, Nabih Berry, announced that Palmer is being sent home because he's been ill. Despite optimistic signs that a release might happen any day, President Reagan continued to talk tough in public. If we permit terrorism to succeed anywhere, it will spread like a cancer, eating away at civilized societies and sowing fear and chaos everywhere. Nevertheless, a deal was in the making. And after resolving some last-minute hitches, the TWA hostages were released. Ironically, the lines of communication that were open to gain the release of the TWA hostages began a new chapter in the troubled relationship between the U.S. and Iran. A chapter that concerned seven remaining American hostages. Those hostages had been kidnapped off the streets of Beirut one at a time by one branch or another of Islamic Jihad, beginning in 1982. And always the demands were the same. An exchange of radical fundamentalists held prisoner by Israel for the hostage. A scant three months after the TWA hijacking, though, one of the hostages was suddenly released, the Reverend Benjamin Weir. And then the following July, the Reverend Lawrence Jenko. I'm just so happy to be on my way home. And after 523 days of captivity, David Jacobson was released in November of 1986. My joy is somewhat diminished by the fact that other captives are still being held in Lebanon. And those hostages would not be released soon. The same week that Jacobson was released, the first accounts of what came to be known as the Iran-Contra scandal became public. It turned out the Reagan administration, despite repeated denials, had in fact traded U.S. arms for hostages. The emperor was naked. Uh, we had been lecturing the world on, on being tough on terrorism, and we were caught doing business with the most terror-minded regime in the, re in the region, the Iranian regime. The revelations forced the resignation of Robert McFarlane, the national security advisor, John Poindexter, his successor, and Colonel Oliver North, who had masterminded the operation. But if he did it, it's the biggest mistake that's been made by a president in a long time. The growing frustration in the United States that the most powerful nation on earth could do nothing to help its citizens caused the U.S. to trade arms for hostages in the first place. I know that it's rainy, it's cold, and it's uncomfortable. But if you think you're uncomfortable, you just think about Terry Anderson. The last hostage, Associated Press Bureau Chief Terry Anderson, was not released until December 4th, 1991. He had been held captive almost seven years. You just do what you have to do. You wake up every day and you summon up the energy from somewhere, even when you think you haven't got it, and you get through the day. And you do it day after day after day. Three Americans were killed by their captors, William Buckley, the CIA's Beirut station chief, Peter Kilburn of Beirut University, and Lieutenant Colonel William Higgins, who was working for UN peacekeeping forces. Throughout the four decades of the Cold War, Berlin was a perennial trouble spot, the vital nervous center in the East-West conflict, and Americans stationed there were accustomed to living on the cutting edge of crisis. But in April of 1986, when West Berlin's fragile stability was shattered by a sudden act of violence, the attack did not come from the city's longtime foes in the Soviet bloc. There's been yet another major terrorist incident, this time in Berlin. A bomb ripped through a nightclub frequented by Americans. Among those killed in the explosion at La Belle Discotheque in Berlin were two American soldiers. Who was responsible? Always with this shadowy world, with this trail of terror, it was in part a trail of vapor, it disappeared on you. You couldn't always prove who was behind a particular operation. But officials in Washington had no doubt who was behind this campaign of violence against Americans. Even before the Berlin bombing, in a speech in New Orleans, President Reagan had singled out Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. We're aware of intensive Libyan preparations that were already underway for terrorist operations against Americans. Mr. Gaddafi must know that we will hold him fully accountable for any such actions. 
And in the aftermath of the bombing, he stepped up his rhetoric against the Libyan dictator. Well, we know that this mad dog of the Middle East has a, a goal of a world revolution, Muslim fundamentalist revolution. U.S. officials say they have very solid intelligence linking the Berlin disco bombing to Libya. According to one official, there is conclusive evidence that the attack was coordinated by the Libyan Diplomatic Mission, or People's Bureau, in East Berlin. If Gaddafi is going to, in effect, spawn terrorism, tolerate it, export it, then we should deal with it. And in my view, uh, the sooner the better. And from the executive office, President Reagan was sounding more and more like a commander-in-chief about to take action. I've said we're not going to just sit here and hold still. We all, and I mean by all, I mean that we in our country, plus our friends and allies throughout the, the free world, have got to set down standards and make it plain that there will be retaliation and that terrorism cannot succeed. Gaddafi's response to the growing threat of U.S. force was to call President Reagan an old man. He went on to say that he was not afraid of America's military strength because he knew the Soviet Union would not remain silent if the U.S. attacked him. But a Soviet spokesman was quick to contradict him. What Mr. Gaddafi says is not always true. And we have no agreement of military cooperation with Mr. Gaddafi. As for Gaddafi, Pentagon sources say he has not yet put his military forces on alert. As one military officer put it, the only thing he's moving is his mouth. Yet even as plans were finalized for a military strike, the Reagan administration urged West Germany and other European allies to join the U.S. in economic and political sanctions against Libya. And the allies yielded, to some degree, to U.S. pressure. In West Berlin today, the Allies took a small step to support U.S. moves on terrorism. The French and British military commanders agreed to an American request to tighten up on security. Anyone considered a threat can now be expelled or banned from the Allied sector of the city. But the Europeans, and the Italians in particular, remain unconvinced that the evidence implicating Libya is strong enough to justify a U.S. military response. But President Reagan's mind was made up. Gaddafi must be punished. And on April 14th, nine days after the disco explosion in Berlin, 18 F-111s took off from bases in Britain on a mission to bomb specified targets in Libya. They arrived over Tripoli before dawn. At about 2 o'clock this morning, there was the sound of jets going overhead. It sounded like at least two coming in very low, very fast. There were a series of loud explosions quite near the hotel. We could hear explosions, the sound of heavy impacts of bombs hitting the ground. Libya would later claim more than 100 casualties, many of them civilians. Among the dead and wounded were a number of children. Two of Gaddafi's sons were wounded. His 15-month-old adopted daughter, Hana, was killed. The bombers did not escape unharmed either. Two U.S. airmen were killed when one of the planes crashed into the sea. But in spite of those losses, the Pentagon had nothing but praise for the mission. Publicly, the Pentagon says the raid was flawless. Privately, officials call it a mixed success. Mixed because a plane was lost and civilians killed, and because one of the targets, a commando training base, was not hit. But these same officials add that given the complexity of the mission, a mixed success was probably the best that could be expected. What, what it's clear now who is assassin. It's clear, and uh, the Arab will will show you and your country what's our answer. And inventing their outrage, the Libyans had plenty of company. Most governments around the world today condemn the U.S. strike against Libya. The bulk of NATO nations, France, the Soviet bloc, China, and the Arab world all criticized. Israel, Britain, and Canada supported the action. The French government was so opposed to the air raid that it refused to permit U.S. bombers to fly over its territory. From their bases in Britain, the F-111s had to take the long way around, over open seas, and enter the Mediterranean at the Straits of Gibraltar. The United Nations passed a resolution condemning the raid. But the U.S. justified its action, claiming the link between the Berlin bombing and Libya was solid. Before. I'd say it was so clear that even doubters uh, who have seen the evidence would, uh, would accept it is, is just incontrovertible. But nearly two years later, in January of 1988, 
German investigators came up with evidence that pointed in another direction. Christina Endrakeit, a 27-year-old West German, was arrested today in Lübeck, West Germany, and she was flown to Berlin. German officials allege that she planted the bomb in La Belle Discotheque two years ago. German officials have tied her to two Palestinian terrorists, both of whom are now in prison for other acts of terror. And those two men are said to have had stronger ties to Syria than to Libya. Nevertheless, at the time of the air raid on Libya, there was a fear, even among those who approved of the mission, that retaliation would only lead to counter-retaliation. And a little more than two years later, an airline disaster in the sky over Scotland offered ample reason to believe those fears were justified. The date was December 21st, 1988, just four days before Christmas. Pan American Flight 103. The flight took off from Heathrow at 2.35 this afternoon, Eastern U.S. time, northward toward Scotland. Less than one hour later, Flight 103 vanished from the radar screens and fell from the nighttime sky over the village of Lockerbie. Of its 259 passengers, 187 were Americans, a group that included 37 students from Syracuse University who just completed a semester of study in England and were flying home for the holidays. Everyone on board the Pan Am jumbo jet was killed, as were 11 other persons on the ground. I have this horrible sound. It was like a rushing and a screaming noise, and the whole sky just lit up. A ball of fire went, what, 300 feet in the air and then mushroomed out. We thought it was a nuclear explosion. Oh, my God, it's terrible. And then sparks, and then the whole thing went down. After a year of painstaking investigation, the evidence showed that the bomb had been triggered by a Swiss-made timing device, which had been sold to a Libyan intelligence officer. That breakthrough led investigators to other pieces of evidence that clearly implicated the government of Libya and its leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Murder warrants are out tonight for two Libyan spies. They are now formally charged with bombing Pan Am Flight 103 out of the sky over Lockerbie, Scotland. Indicted two Libyan intelligence officers, 39-year-old Abdul Basset, chief of Libyan airline security operations, and 35-year-old Laman Fima, an undercover agent who worked as Libyan Arab Airlines representative in Malta. They are charged with placing a bomb aboard Pan Am 103 and killing all of its passengers. Yes, they are ready you now. There was not enough hard evidence to indict Gaddafi himself, but U.S. officials had no doubt that he was behind the bombing and that he had ordered it in retaliation for the 1986 air raid on Libya. This was a Libyan government operation from start to finish. We hold the Libyan government responsible for the murder of 270 people over Lockerbie, Scotland. Americans have long understood that the world is a dangerous place. After all, during the years of the Cold War, the threat of nuclear devastation was an all too real possibility. But at least then, the threat came from an enemy we could identify. But that changed. Americans had to learn to cope with a much different kind of menace, one that was unpredictable, impulsive, and not instantly recognizable. We have learned that we are vulnerable. We have also learned that there is an underside or a price to be paid for power, that it's the fate of people who have power to be resented and the fate of people who have power to be hated. The randomness of terror was especially hard to take in a nation whose people always prided themselves on their ability to move about freely, without fear, at home or abroad. But by the end of the century, that was no longer the case. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century.